when the Apostle Paul speaks to the church, comparing them to a soldier. He says that they should put on their feet readiness given by the gospel of peace. But isn't that a paradox? How can the image of military illustrate peace? Welcome to another tidbit from the Bible. I'm Dr. Paul Peterson. We are studying Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. We are close to the end of the series. This is the second to last. We have 14 altogether. Last time we looked at the text in Ephesians 6, 10 to 20, where Paul describes the Christian church as a soldier. So let's reflect a little today on that image. We will speak about two major themes, peace and unity, illustrated from the military life. But first, is Paul speaking about what we in Western terminology would call a just war? What Muslims would call a jihad. Are we speaking about a holy war? Are we here speaking, is Paul speaking, about carrying arms in order to forward the gospel? The answer is no. Now, there is something called a holy war. There's something called a just war. Whether it is just or not, it is always up to discussion. When President Obama was given the Nobel Peace Prize, the paradox was, of course, that he was waging war in Afghanistan. Nothing said from my side about the righteousness of doing that, but he felt that he needed in his uh, speech to defend the fact that he was given a peace prize while waging war. It is a paradox. And down through the ages, Christians, Muslims, and other religious fighters have battled on the war field to further their course. When the conquistadors conquered South America, oh, that it's so with the sword in the hand. Now, is that what Paul is speaking about? We're still saying onward Christian soldiers, don't we? Although after the many wars of the Second World War, the 20th century wars, I am with many people a little hesitant. I don't like war. I don't like the image. Now, let's go then to the text of Ephesians. First, the phrase used in the description of the soldier in chapter 6, verse 15, is taken to a degree from the book of Isaiah, who in 52, 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says, to Zion your God reigns. This is one of the texts of the Old Testament from which we have the phrase gospel, evangelion, the good news. And this is where you have the message of peace brought by the runner, the messenger, his feet are then beautiful because he's characterized by his feet when he's running with his message of the gospel. In Ephesians, peace is an important thing. The very opening greeting says, grace to you and peace, shalom, would be the Hebrew expression, from God the Father, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And peace is important in bringing people together in the church. Paul has spoken about the fact that the peace message given by Christ will bring, will, will tear down the enemy, 
the, 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 the hostility between the enemies of Jews and Gentiles. Listen to these texts. 2.14 He, Christ, himself is our peace, who has made us both, Jews and Gentiles, one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. In verse 17 and 18 he continues, And he came and preached to you who were far off, and peace to you, those who were near. For through him we have both access in one spirit to the Father. So, Christ brought people together who once were enemies. He created peace on a horizontal level between human beings. How did he do that? And the text says in verse 13, and we are still in chapter 2, Now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. In other words, it is a sacrifice of Christ, his death on the cross, that has brought free access to the Father for everyone and has been able to unite Gentiles and Jews, and we would today say people of all backgrounds, whether ethnic, gender, social differences that tear them apart, he has been able to bring all together and create a unity, a community in the Church of Peace. The Bible, Ephesians in particular, speaks about another reason how that comes about. He speaks in chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, about bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And we'll return to that unity in a moment. But first, let's reflect on the paradox of the military metaphor. When the Bible in the New Testament, uses a metaphor. It is as an anti-war message. Let me go to another book of the Bible, that is a book of Revelation, that is uh, with very dramatic war images and expressions. But notice the very point, that is, the victory is won by a slain lamb, meeting awful, horrible, dangerous, threatening, monstrous, the slain lamb with its blood running is winning the battle. How? By dying. So when the last day is coming, they, all the enemies of God will become afraid of what? of the wrath of a lamb. That's a paradox. It's a paradox because it is. Jesus won the victory by turning the other cheek, by letting people take his life, letting the devil take his life in, in, the, in the great battle between good and evil, by not using force. So the battle is to be one on earth. Now I believe that one day God will finish it and he will use his force but the church as a soldier of God is not to use force. The victory is a victory of a slain lamb and the Christian church is never to use violence, force or weapons in its mission. The church is never to unite with the forces of state or government in order to accomplish its goals. Now some would say, but isn't there police? Isn't Paul speaking about the authority of governments? Yes, but that's not the authority of the church. That is where we as citizens support law and order. But as a church in its mission, 
we should never unite with the forces of state or government in order to accomplish our goals. We should never use violence, force or weapons in our mission. The Church has done so throughout the ages. It doesn't make it right. The Crusades were the paradox. Using the symbol of the cross to cut down enemies with a sword. The text we read from Ephesians 4, 2 and 3 also emphasized the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So why is a military metaphor used to indicate unity? Now let me repeat, I don't like war. I have this scary sense of soldiers marching in unity towards me in society to kill, to destroy. That is not what is behind the image here. First of all, God's soldier is a church. It's not the individual members. Paul is putting on the army or asking the church to put on the, the weaponry for the church, which has previously in the epistle been compared to one person, a human being. 2.15, that God might create in himself one new man in place of the two, that is, Jews and Gentiles, so making peace. Or in 3.16, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, speaking about the community life of the church. It's a corporate entity, it's not the individual. The background for that is the unique unity of the victorious Roman army. Soldiers were united, they walked together, they ran together, they protected themselves together in units with their shields and so on, in a splendid work out of unity that gave them victory time after time. Our unity is not identical with the military unity of uniformity. Our unity as a Christian church is to be a unity of love. A love that conquers all enemies, even to the death on a cross. Even when Christians suffer, because they turn the other cheek. Our unity is not a forced unity. It's a unity spring that springs out of the love of Christ within our community of faith. And that love will conquer all enemies. It has already done so when Christ died on the cross. It will do so again. Thank you for listening to this tidbit from Ephesians and welcome back as we finish this series with a final review of central themes in Ephesians, primarily the theme of the Trinity. Thank you.